It's TED Talks Daily. I'm Elise Hugh. Today's talk is a delight. Community organizer Ty Simpson tells the story of her indigenous people and her ancestors as a way to show us the power of storytelling in the work of anti-racism. I was rapt while listening to her stories and their lessons from her talk at TEDx Boise in 2019. So this might be the part where some of you get really, really excited that there's a real live Native American walking the stage right now, so you have plans to run up to me later and tell me exactly how much Cherokee pedigree you have. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's not a thing that connects us. It's not the Native American jewelry you may or may not own, nor is it your upbringing and proximity to indigenous people that connects us. But before I go there, I will translate for you. I cursed all of you. Uh, in, it is customary in many of our nations to introduce ourselves first in our indigenous language. It is a way of honoring our elders and our ancestors for the sacrifices that they made for me to be alive and to take up this space. I spoke Nimiputimt, the language of the Nez Perce Nation. Uh, my ancestors hear me when I speak our language. For those of you who don't understand, I thanked Creator first. I offered thanks for our good day today. I told you that my name is the storyteller. In the language of our colonizers, I am called Ty Simpson. I told you that I am a Nez Perce woman, Nimipu, as we call ourselves. I told you that I am a direct descendant of Chief Red Heart of the Nez Perce Nation. I told you also that um, I'm happy to be here. And I told you that as a storyteller, the stories that I carry are not my own. They are passed from generation to generation and belong to my ancestors. The The stories created in my lifetime belong to my descendants. That's an important recognition for us to make. It is also important to recognize that we are guests today and every day on the ancestral homelands of the forced, displaced, and dispossessed Boise Valley indigenous people. Our colonizers refer to them as the Shoshone Bannock, the Shoshone Paiute, the Burns Paiute, the Fort McDermott, and Warm Springs Paiute tribes. You're welcome for the land, Boise. (laughs) As a storyteller, all of my favorite stories involve Coyote or Itzyeye. He's the trickster who, over time, carried our ways of knowing. There is a contemporary variation of our creation story that speaks of Coyote meandering along the river one day, and he sort of stopped where he was, and he said, you know, I want to create the different races. So he bent down and reached for tule. Tule is a large reed-like plant that we use for weaving, and he made himself a mold with two legs instead of four, arms, legs, fingers. I mean, we all know what humans look like, right? He mixed his clay by the the river, and then he made a fire by the river as well. He put his clay and his mold into the fire, and the first time Itzyeye was just impatient, and he pulled his mold out while it was undercooked and pale, almost white. Watu yokta'a, Itzyeye said, this isn't quite right. So he chucked that mold across the ocean. (laughs) That became white people, or soyapo, as we've come to call them. Itzyeye tried again. He made another mold, and he mixed his clay, and he soaked his fire, and he he put his mold into the fire. And this time, he got distracted. He ran off to the prairie to play tricks, and he ran back down to the river to play more tricks. And then when he made his way back to his fire, his mold was overcooked and dark, almost black. Watu, yokta'a, this isn't quite right, Itzyeye said, so he threw that mold to the south. He was frustrated but determined, so he tried again. He made his mold and he mixed his clay and he put that into the fire as well. But he waited this time and he danced and he sang and he prayed by his fire until just the right moment. And when he pulled that mold out, ah, yokta'a, this is right. We were Coyote's creation, he called us to token. And the lesson that I've always been taught from that story is that Indian people are from the land and the water and the fire here. We don't come from anywhere else. But I also rethought that story, so let's circle back to the beginning. Despite being undercooked and chucked across the ocean, white people are also coyotes' creation. That's the thing that connects us. It's a bit of a reach and kind of laughable. I laughed at it. 
despite the sordid, tumultuous history between us of decolonization, dehumanization, forced displacement, sterilization, I could go on all evening. That doesn't mean that human to human we are not connected, my white brothers and sisters. Some of us are a little more undercooked than others. I do believe in our connection, because Coyote was at the meeting that Creator called on the slopes of the Clearwater River near what is now known as Lewiston, Idaho. Nimipu people call that Siminicum. On that day, Creator called together all of the large animals that were here before they were humans. He asked, he told them all, there's going to be a great change and some of them wouldn't survive. He asked each of them to step forward and offer a piece of themselves so that humans could be created. Wawokia, Elk stepped forward and said, my, to- my horns can be used for tools and my hide can be worn for warmth and my flesh to eat. Natsoch, salmon, stepped forward and said, my flesh can be ate as well and he promised to come to humans in the wintertime. Waptis, eagle, stepped forward and said, I want to fly so high and bring the humans' messages to you. They will use my feathers for ceremony and they will know creator through me. I will be their wisdom. And it was like this for each animal, for bear, for otter, for deer, for steelhead, each of them offering a part of themselves so humanity could be created. And all we had to do as humans was be good stewards of the land. All we had to do was keep things in balance. Don't waste. Don't take more than we need. Protect the sacred. And that's an intergenerational, lifelong lesson that we live by even now. Don't strip the huckleberry bush of all of its berries. Don't hunt cow elk in the winter when she could be carrying calves. Don't dig so deep below the root that you damage the earth beneath it. Everything in balance. But that's not where we are anymore, is it? As humans, with our fancy cars and our iPhones, our mineral-based computers, faces that we've carved onto rocks to honor presidents, climbing on our sacred sites, poisoning our water, plastic. Did we hold up our end of the bargain? Do we keep things in balance as humanity? Not so much. But are we so far gone that we can't come back to the center, that we can't come back to this idea of protecting the sacred? Protecting the sacred means recognizing the sacrifices that were made for us so that we could exist. It means giving back to the community so the community is strong. And, you know, protecting the sacred is a relatively new term based on our old ways, our old ways of knowing and our old ways of being and our old ways of living, many of those things taught to us as children. As a child, I didn't grow up on an Indian reservation. I was afforded the privileged opportunity to travel and live abroad. I did, however, spend my summers with my gram, or Katsa, mother's mother. She's equal parts fury and love, a trait shared amongst the Red Heart women. Uh, I would just babble her ear off with all the cool things I thought I was doing. Katsat, I can play the cello. Katsat, I got straight A's. Katsat, I read this book and that cool book. And we were living overseas, so I thought I was fancy and exciting. She would just laugh and smile at me in her quiet way. There was one summer afternoon where my toddler niece was outside with her spoon, and she was using that spoon to scrape the insides out of a fish. And in the middle of my incessant chatter, Katsat turns to me, she says, Tatai, as she used to call me. Can you clean fish? Can you help her finish? Well, no, Katsat, I don't know how to do that. Well, come here then. We'll help you. Morningstar will teach you. So to my chagrin, at like 13 years old, I've got a niece who's like negative four years old schooling me with her tiny little hands and her tiny little spoon digging the guts out of this fish. But none of that was to embarrass me or shame me or put my accomplishments down. What Katsat was teaching me was that regardless of all of the cool things we think we know, and all of the cool things we think we can do, there's always something more to learn and always something more to give back to the community. Our old ways. Traveling the world is awesome, Ty, but do you know how to provide for your family? Playing the cello is cool, Ty, but do you know how to provide for your community in the old way? Gathering roots, catching fish, harvesting berries, beading, weaving, sewing, storytelling. And that was the powerful lesson for me that day at 13, to learn all of this cool stuff, but then learn how to filter it so that I can provide to my family in our old ways. And I have another old ways story that's more of a sidebar than a life lesson, but it talks about old ways, so it might segue back to the point, but I digress. I hit that really awkward age of like half woman, half teenager. I was feeling myself. (laughs) Yeah, I knew everything. I had all the answers. Just ask me. 
And don't judge me, y'all were teenagers once too. <laughs> uh, it was at that age too when like boys would notice me and I would notice back and my mom would just kind of laugh at it all. And uh, she told me one day, she's like, you can date whoever you want, but you can't get married until you have a man that brings me 10 horses, half a dozen blankets, a few pounds of beads, hides, and a freezer full of meat every year for four or five years. <laughs> Excuse me, what, mother? <laughs> I was aghast at her dowry-like grocery list. Because <laughs> at that age, I'm like, I'm going to do what I want, and I'm going to date who I want, but of course I did the wrong thing, and I dated the wrong man, and I ended up crying in my mother's arms anyway. And she reminded me, Ty, you need the man that will bring me 10 horses, half a dozen blankets, a few pounds of beads, hides, and meat, because that's him providing and protecting and giving in our old ways. That became a filter for me in all of my interpersonal relationships and how I interact with my community. What are we doing to show the people in our lives that they are sacred and that they matter and that they're protected? What are we doing as acts of kindness to each other in our community and to strangers? Especially in this nonchalant, indifferent age of self-checkout and Uber Eats and swiping right. The ones that chuckled swipe left most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but fast forward to now, if I ever bring home a swipe right dude with nothing from my mom's list, she's probably going to send me to go live with my dad's family. Go be his problem then. <laughs> then again, red heart women, equal parts fury and love. She may give the right man room to prove himself in our old ways. But real quick, who brought 10 horses, half a dozen blankets, a few pounds of beads, hides meat? My mom is here. Anybody? <laughs> oh, old ways. Some days I think our old ways should be the only ways. The old ways need to come back in style. They need to go viral, as the kids say these days. They're the thing that center us on protecting the sacred, on keeping things in balance, and on protecting the sacred. Old ways are what help us repair nature, especially in the aftermath of our damage to nature. Humans are why humans can't have nice things. Back in 2016, I went to Standing Rock when the prayer and protest camps were being set up in staunch opposition to the Dakota Access Pipelines. We arrived mid-morning and drove all night from Nimipu country to North Dakota. That first day, we set up our tents and we milled around the camp and we made ourselves as useful as we could. But that next morning was life-changing for me. I woke up at about five in the morning listening to the camp come alive. And at one point I got up and I made my way to the big fire at the top of the hill near the entrance to the camp. And there were elders there telling stories. There was one particular Lakota old woman that was telling stories about her upbringing on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. And she was captivating. Midway through one of her stories, there was an older gentleman who interrupted her and asked, why are we here? When will this protest be at its end? How long will we be here? She took her time in her response. She took a few sips of her coffee. And then she glanced slowly at each of the faces watching her with eager interest. And then she took a few more sips of her coffee. And then she heaved this deep concerted sigh, and when she returned her glance to him, she said, my people are from here. I have no other home, I have no other place to go, I don't belong anywhere else. So I will be here, fighting these oil pipelines until they stop drilling, or until I die. I have never been moved by that level of conviction in my life until that moment. I will be here until they stop drilling or until I die. As a community, as a broad, everybody's an American kind of community, we've lost that sense of conviction. What are we all committed to? What makes us better? What are we striving for? I will be here until they stop drilling or until I die. And if that doesn't change you in some way in this moment today, is there anything that can save us? 
I mean, think about the similar older women in your lives and listen, they could probably be telling you stories about a time you couldn't possibly fathom. In those stories, listen for those moments of conviction that drove, propelled, and inspired these women to lead and to fight and to die for what they believe in. This Lakota woman wasn't dying or putting her life on the line recklessly. Her ancestors had lived and died on that very land. She was compelled to protect and defend that very same land for the descendants coming after her. I don't belong anywhere else. I will be here until they stop drilling or until I die. So you see, we've come full circle. We've come from creation to growth to change to death, all of it centered on protecting the sacred. And if there's anything we take away from today, it's that we have an obligation to do so, to protect the sacred, to give to our communities, and to keep nature in balance. I hope that in this room full of my mostly white brothers and sisters that you're changed in some small way, that you're changed in such a way that you will lead and live lives and teach and vote in such a way that reflects what indigenous people have known for a very long time, that the way that we behave politically, socially, economically, ecologically, since the inception of this country isn't working. There is an old adage that says that indigenous people live and walk in two worlds, that we cling and clutch to our culture and our religion and our language, everything about who we are, while simultaneously educating and advancing ourselves in a predominantly white, non-native world. It is an everyday struggle to keep one foot in your world while maintaining who we are and remembering who we are as indigenous people. Maybe it's time for all of us to be in one world, to walk in one world together. And that world is not the world that you're accustomed to. We are all Coyote's creation. Some of us undercooked, some of us overcooked, some of us perfect. <laughs> we have a responsibility to each other because we are all a community. We've committed to stay in balance. We've committed to protect the sacred as Coyote and as Creator intended. Enam Nixasa Hewis Timina Ilp Ilp Kanich. I am a descendant of Chief Red Heart of the Nez Perce Nation. Enam Wunitwa Satitwatit. I am the storyteller. Katsia Ya Yoh Kalo. Thank you. That is all. TED Talks Daily is hosted by me, Elise Hugh, and produced by TED. Theme music is from Allison Layton Brown, and our mixer is Christopher Fazy Bogan. We record the talks at TED events we host or from TEDx events, which are organized independently by volunteers all over the world. And we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or email us at podcasts at TED.com.